In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. 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 Christ is in our midst. He is in our midst. Thank you. First of all, especially after hearing that epistle reading, I have to say that I love you. I love you. I love, thank you. I heard one I love you too back. Thank you. I love you very much. And, and uh, that's why I stand in front of you on this frightful day. <laughs> A strange and hard day to give a homily. I've been a priest for three and a half years, about. And this is my first time preaching on the Sunday before the uh, election day. So that brings some weight to the day. And then also, I get the story of Lazarus and the rich man. So I'm prompted to talk about the potential of separation from God today. But then we're also given a little cookie today in the epistle reading, a little sweet. <laughs> love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. You must know, beloved in Christ, that everything in the church, everything that we believe is about love. It has to do with love. There's nothing that doesn't have to do with love in the church. Love is everything because Christ is everything. Since it's my first year preaching, and this is, you know, the, the election, it's not a liturgical commemoration, just so you know, it's a secular one. <laughs> so that's worth keeping in mind. But. I do think I can get away with at least this first time saying that one thing I do want to emphasize is the presidency of Christ in our lives. I like the, the word presidency because it has to do with the one who presides. In the church, the, the priest is called the proestominos, and that's the one who presides. He presides at the liturgy. And, of course, the priest who presides at the liturgy is only an icon or an image who, of Christ who presides in heaven serving the eternal liturgy. And so when I talk about the presidency of Christ, I'm not talking in worldly terms. I'm not saying, you know, that he's like the president of the United States or something like that or, or anything like that. You know, the presidency of the United States is a fairly novel thing. And the presidency of Christ before the eternal throne room at the altar in heaven is endless, without beginning and without end. So that is, that's the transcendent reality for us, the presidency of Christ, Jesus, he who presides, bringing us to the Father. And... Uh, That's, that's something that I want to emphasize today. Regardless of what happens this coming week, we're still going to pray for our president, civil authorities, and armed forces. Regardless of who is in this temporal position of worldly responsibility. Um, and we will continue. There's no, there's no earthly president whose feet will key, kiss, but we've, we kiss the feet of our Lord Jesus. He's the only one worth truly venerating and honoring in that way. Today I want to proclaim to you, as I'm proclaiming the presidency, the presiding of our Lord Jesus in our lives as the one and only true authority for us Christians. I also want to proclaim the kingdom of God. I want to proclaim the kingdom of God as our true homeland. Even the ground that we stand on is temporal. But again, once again, there's something eternal, there's something more permanent. There is something more real that upholds us than even the ground that we stand on. It's the reality that our life is given to us 
by God through Christ, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And we have a, a harrowing tale in today's parable that challenges us with the reminder of what's at stake if we don't understand that. If we don't take that reality to heart, if we treat it as if this life is all that we have to live, this life on earth, and if we forget about things eternal, if we, as Christ says elsewhere, store up our riches on earth, or we seek our satisfactions only in temporal things, especially at the expense of others. In this uh, parable that our Lord Jesus gives us of Lazarus and the rich man, some of us can identify with Lazarus and some of, some of us can identify with the rich man. And I was, sorry, I was weeping in the altar this morning thinking, some of you can identify with Lazarus a little too much in the hell that you've experienced on this side of eternity. The pain and the suffering and the alienation that you've experienced. And maybe without even like a dog to come and lick your sores. So if you've experienced intense pain and suffering on this side, remember the hope that we have and the promise of our Lord Jesus. There's something far greater to look forward to, beloved ones. Abraham said, he said that Lazarus suffered evil things, but now he's comforted here. And so I'm here to proclaim to you the comfort that is to come, and actually the comfort that you can begin to experience when the rift between the, the rift and the veil between heaven and earth takes place here in the church. You begin to experience just a little bit of the consolation of the kingdom which is to come. So beloved ones, I, those of you who, who can identify with Lazarus a little too much today, I'm sorry, but I proclaim to you, I proclaim to you that there's something greater at work and there is a hope in the kingdom that is to come. And then there are many of us complacent ones comfortable ones who can identify with the rich man a little too much. The, the human condition is one in which we become blind to seeing that which God has created us to see, to see him and to see our neighbor. In this gospel reading, we hear about this rich man who lived from day to day. He, uh, he got what he wanted. He felt like his needs were met. He walked past those in need because he had every need in his own life met. So he was oblivious to the needs of others. He became willfully blind to the suffering of his neighbor. Getting what he wanted and needed and desired on this side of eternity he separated himself from God because he separated himself from his neighbor. You remember that precious teaching of St. Siloan, my brother is my life. And beloved ones, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that our hearts are too hard to, to understand that reality that my brother is my life. But we have to beg God, especially in light of this, again, this kind of scary, scary harrowing parable that reveals to us the possibility of separation from God. For those who maintain such hardness of heart, we have to beg of our Savior to begin to let us to see, grant us eyes to see and ears to hear. The main trouble we have with that is when he grants us eyes to see and ears to hear and hands to touch, we begin to experience in a profound way the woundedness of the world that we live in, like our Savior did then our calling becomes to be those who are compassionate, who, who suffer, yes, we know what suffering is like, but suffer alongside those who are suffering. And then we come to understand what it means to fulfill Christ's commandments, to bear one another's burdens, 
to bear one another's burdens. In a community like ours, two things have to happen. We have to seek out the opportunity to bear the burden of others. How can I help the other? How can I serve my brother or sister? How can I seek to bear the burdens of my brother or sister in Christ and so fulfill the law of Christ? And then the second one is another very humbling one. How can I allow my burdens to be shared by others? If I am burdened, if I'm weighed down, feeling separated, scared, unsure, and I don't want to burden others, that's another strange form of pride that we struggle with sometimes. Who am I to burden the other? Allow the other to be burdened so that they can fulfill the, the commandment of Christ. And I'm not saying take advantage of others, but... This is something we have to strive to discern in order for us to, to be a community with one another. To bear one another's burdens. To love one another. If we don't love one another in this way, what kind of witness do we have to the world that we live in? Piety, superficiality, re religiosity, ideology. But, beloved, we have to incarnate the faith that we have by being members of one another. We start there, and then we, we spread our wings, our branches out, and we have to love those around us, those who are suffering, those who are in pain. What does that mean for us, Lord? Grant us the wisdom and the discernment. We have the hospital. And as here, let's invite those in, but as those who are seeking healing, also grant us the strength as, as those being healed and humbled by the loving touch of our Savior to go out and touch those who seem, seem, are seemingly untouchable. How about the person I don't agree with or I don't want to talk to? How about the person that, uh, that I think is a hypocrite? <laughs> I prove my own hypocrisy when I start calling someone else a hypocrite because... The only reason I know about hypocrisy is because I am one myself. <laughs> I'm rambling a little bit, but it's important for us. This is our paradigm. And this is our way, and this is our unconditional reality. Regardless of what temporal, worldly regimes come and go, this is who we are, and this is our calling. To worship God, to worship at His footstool, the only Holy One who's worthy of our time and our attention, and to serve, honor, love one another unconditionally. I've come to terms with something about the human condition. One of the indications of the human condition is our conditionality. We change according to condition. We're so, uh, we vacillate, you know, we're, but Christ does not vacillate. Christ does not change his mind. Uh, he loves you the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, and he'll never stop loving you. And so as we strive to become more like him, we have to strive to become purveyors of the unconditional love of Christ. The unconditional love of Christ. Then we won't have to, we won't have to worry so much about this, this possibility of separation from God that, that happened to the rich man in this story. Interestingly enough, if you, I could really go into some detail analyzing this gospel reading. This gospel reading, you have a man, we know his name is Lazarus. What about the rich man? What's his name? You don't know him because he didn't allow his name to be known by God. The broken man who knew he had nothing and was nothing ended up in the bosom of Abraham on his way to the kingdom of heaven. 
That's one of the reasons why, dear ones, when you come up for, for communion, I like to call you by name. You're remembered. I do my best. You know, so everyone's like, oh, what's their patron saint? But it's precious to me because what it does is it represents the fact that God knows who you are. He knows you by name. The shepherd knows his sheep by name and he loves them. And he wants to feed them. And just like he said to Peter, he says to me, feed my sheep. That's my job. That's my act of love for you. Okay. I could talk more about uh, heaven and hell, but I think I want to leave it at these exhortations for you today, beloved in Christ. It would be quite easy to look at this gospel reading and think, crud, I don't like this idea of separation from God. Good. Neither do I. And we should have some level of fear over the possibility of separation, but fear is overcome by perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Thank you so much. Perfect love casts out We haven't perfected love in ourselves, but Christ has, and He wants to perfect it in us. He wants to perfect it in us if we allow Him to if we allow him to. So beloved in Christ, my, my intense prayer, my weeping, my exhortation, my joy and my suffering, all bound up, is in this heartfelt desire that you and me and all of us would come to understand that Christ is the one who presides. That Christ is the one who calls us all without condition unto himself so that we can enter into the unconditional reality of our identity as being those who are members of his household who he wants to feed with incorruptible things not passing things who he wants to provide us with a supernatural peace and comfort a comfort that the world cannot provide draw near to him beloved ones let him take up his abode in you let him feed you and comfort you. Draw near to him. Draw near to one another. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen.